Oh, good to be together this morning. A uh, little worship mashup during that uh, last song. That was amazing. It is good to be together. Uh, I am back, and we're back in the book of Acts. How many of you enjoyed last week, though, with Kristen preaching? I know she's my wife, but that was amazing. If you missed that, uh, go online and listen to it. You can go to Spotify or your podcast of choice. You can find it there as well. Well worth your time. So we're jumping back into the book of Acts. And uh, last time uh, we spoke on this, a couple weeks ago, uh, we left off. Paul and Barnabas have returned back from their first of three missionary trips around the Roman Empire. And they don't know it's one of three at this point, but they finished this first one. And so after traveling and starting churches on the island of Cyprus and in the cities of Pisidia of Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe, Paul and Barney, who I often call him, he's my favorite, finally make it back to their home base in Antioch of Syria. They are literally beaten and battered from this trip. You may recall that Paul was stoned nearly to death while he was in Lystra. So one can only imagine what it must be like for them to be surrounded by close friends and family and to sleep in their own bed. I mean, I'm gone for like three days and I'm just like, oh, my own bed. And that's without being stoned. So I can only feel, imagine what Paul must feel like at this point. So now I think about what Paul and Barney must have went through uh, after that first missionary trip, and I'm convinced they would have to be sleeping for a month afterwards. I know I would. But as is often the case in ministry, as often is the case when you're pursuing the things of God, there often can be no rest for the weary. And so especially this is true for Paul. So with that in mind, grab your phone if you haven't yet. Open up the YouVersion app. You can follow along in there. Or if you have your Bible with you, we're going to be in Acts chapter 15. That's right. Acts chapter 15. We have officially made it halfway through the book of Acts. Give yourselves a round of applause. I did a little uh, calculating, and we will be finished with the book by 2063. So yes, we're on our way. All right, now, as we pick up the story in the book of Acts, we will be told of one of the great debates in the first century and throughout the history of the church. Debates would often come up uh, in the first century. They would come up throughout history, if you read church history, especially in the early years of the church. But this, the debate we're going to see, would become one of the great debates of all time, and it is something that to this day, many still debate. So you ready? Yes. All right. Acts chapter 15, we're going to start in verse 1. While Paul and Barnabas were at Antioch of Syria, some men from Judea arrived and began to teach the believers... Unless you're circumcised as required by the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, I realize in our 21st century world that this may seem like an odd request coming from the men of Judea, but for the Jewish community and for the Jewish Christian community, remember, those who are becoming Christians, many are Gentiles, but many of them have grown up strictly Jewish. And so this issue of circumcision was an enormous deal among them. Circumcision to the Jewish community was not just simply a medical procedure like it is for many today. Circumcision for the Jews in the first century and still to this day was an identity marker. Look at what it says in Genesis chapter 17. God makes a covenant with his people. He makes a promise with his people. And then he tells them this. He says, this is the covenant that you and your descendants must keep. Each male among you must be circumcised. You must cut off the flesh of your foreskin as a sign of the covenant between you and me. From generation to generation, every male child must be circumcised on the eighth day after his birth. Now I realize as a man, This is an odd decision by God, that this is how he wants to seal his covenant. I mean, he could have done anything, right? Just shave your head, right? Clip your toenails. I don't know, but he chooses circumcision, all right? So it's a little uncomfortable, but this is the reality of where the Jewish people are living. 
And it was an critical importance to who they were as, their, as their, the people of God. It was a tangible sign that reminded them of the covenant, the promise that God had given to them for him to be their God and for them to be their people. So for the Jew in the first century, circumcision was non-negotiable. This was not an optional thing when it came to being made with, right with God. It was an essential. And so it should come as no surprise then that having heard that Gentiles, that's just simply non-Jewish people, are now part of this Christian movement and they're finding out that they're of being allowed to be a part of it without having to you know, acquire the requirement of circumcision. And it has some of the Jewish people in stitches. No pun intended. Right? <laughs> but I'm fine. Come on. I spent all week on that joke. I got booze. I'm going to work on it. Right. So uneasy are they that this large number of people from Judea, these men from Judea, they travel to Antioch in Syria. Now, that doesn't seem like much, except for that it's a 300-mile distance. These dudes are serious about what they're about to bring to Paul and Barnabas. It would have taken them days, maybe weeks, depending on weather and traffic, you know. Oh. <laughs> All to make the case that in order for someone to be saved, they have to be circumcised as required by the law of Moses. Otherwise, they are not right with God, is their argument. Now, Paul and Barnabas hear this argument, and they immediately jump into action. Verse 2, it says, Paul and Barnabas disagreed with them, arguing vehemently. Vehemently, they says. The English Standard Version translates this by saying, that Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them. No small dissension, which can only mean this was a big dissension and debate for Paul and Barnabas. In other words, for Paul and Barnabas, that what these men are saying is such a big deal, they will not let it go. Now listen, in the Christian faith, there are many things that we can agree to disagree about. Right? We, we are individuals as much as we are a community. We have our own convictions and thoughts around some issues that we would consider minor issues within the tradition of our faith. But this, for Paul and Barnabas, is not one of those issues. This, for Paul and Barnabas, is not a let's agree to disagree situation because for them, and we should take note of this, this shakes the very foundation of what it means for a person to be saved and be in a right relationship with God through Jesus. So Paul and Barnabas argue vehemently with them. They will not back down on this issue. Other issues, hey, look, look, we can talk about that. We can love each other. We can agree to disagree. Not this one. Now, you've got to keep in mind, they have spent months with Gentile believers who they watched receive the Holy Spirit through faith and begin to live as the changed lives that they are. And none of them had been circumcised in the process. So part of this for Paul and Barnabas is like, you have not seen what we have seen. The Holy Spirit is working in these people regardless of their ability to hold this law that you say they need to. And so now at this point, this debate you can imagine is just raging and things start to get a little ugly and realizing there's no real way they're going to you know, bring any resolution to this, a move is made to settle the debate. Here's the rest of verse two and three. It says, finally, the church decided to send Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem, accompanied by some local believers to talk to the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent the delegates to Jerusalem and they stopped along the way in Phoenicia and Samaria to visit the believers. They told them, much to everyone's joy, that the Gentiles too were being converted. Now again, this is a distance of about 300 miles that all of these people are now having to travel. The men of Judea, they go up to Antioch, they argue with Paul and Barnabas, and now Paul and Barnabas and the men of Judea and some local believers, they all travel down, you know, 
by bus, I would guess, to, you know, Jerusalem. That's where we're going. And I'm not sure about you. Listen, I'm not sure it'd be you, but I don't travel 300 miles by car unless it's really important, especially with gas prices at $5. I'm not going 300 miles unless I determine this is really important. And that's in a car. I would never walk 300 miles. And neither would you. Okay? This issue is major. Paul and Barnabas realize there is a lot at stake here. Now, for us, we may not see what's happening because we have the beneficiaries of 2,000 years of this argument being fulfilled. But at the time, Paul and Barnabas realized this could change everything if we don't nip, nip this in the bud. And it's a major issue because ultimately what is at stake is the answer to the question, what is required to be a follower of Jesus? What's required? Now, this is maybe the first time the church has, you know, gathered to answer this question, but I'm telling you, it won't be the last. There have been church councils like this one that have sprung up throughout history for the very purpose of answering that question. What does it require to follow Jesus? Verse 4, when they arrived in Jerusalem, Barnabas and Paul were welcomed by the whole church, including the apostles and elders. They reported everything God had done through them. But then some of the believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and insisted the Gentile converts must be circumcised and required to follow the law of Moses. Again, the issue is brought to the table. I can only imagine the exasperation of Paul and Barnabas. It's like, oh, seriously, are we doing this again? We're doing this again? And so they, the issue again is Gentiles must be circumcised. And then the Pharisees, by the way, did you notice there are Pharisees that are now Christians? Huh? Don't tell me about the power of the Holy Spirit in a person's life, right? That it doesn't exist, right? But that's not the point because they're the bad guys right now. So we're going to stick there, Okay. <laughs> So, at least for the time. So, they're, they're not only really arguing, hey, they need to be circumcised. They're also saying, by the way, they need to follow all of the laws in the Old Testament. Do you know how many laws are in the Old Testament? 613. Good luck remembering them, let alone following them. I mean, these are Jewish Christian Pharisees. They're known for being scrupulous in following the law of God. All 613 laws Paul, at one point, was a Pharisee. He, can, he calls himself a Pharisee among Pharisees. Like, he was, you know, the LeBron James of Pharisees. Or Michael Jordan, depending on which generation you're from. Maybe we'll have a church council on that. Who's the greatest NBA player of all time? We won't go there. These Pharisees, these Jewish Christian Pharisees, I mean, they believe in Jesus, but they also believe in this law that they've been given. And I'll be honest, I don't blame them. They have spent thousands of years dedicating themselves to abiding by the Old Testament law. It, have you ever found it hard to let go of some things in your past? Yeah. Yeah. It's hard sometimes. So, so I believe, well, we're going to get to what their conclusion is. This is a necessary debate for the church. They, they don't have the New Testament. They're writing the New Testament right now. They don't have it. They're, they're working this out. They're trying to figure out what does this mean? What is required? How do we do this? How do we blend these groups of people that have different values and different priorities and different histories? How do we do this together? I, I'm so proud of the church, honestly. You know, it could have been easy for Paul and Barnabas to just be like, guys, get out of here. I don't want to hear about it. But instead, they decide, we're going to Jerusalem we're going to figure this out. Amen. We're going to figure this out together. You know, sometimes I hear things I don't like, and my tendency is to just be like, whatever, I don't want to hear it. And I think what the church shows us is that there are important times for us as a church to come together and go, what do we really think about this? How, how do we work through this together? So they meet together. Verse 6, so the apostles and elders met together to resolve this issue. At the meeting... After a long discussion, that doesn't tell us how long, 
But notice it says long discussion. Can you imagine the scene as all of these people come together? I mean, they just go at it. They're sharing their arguments. They're quoting scripture. They're determined to come to some conclusion back and forth. They go, I'm sure there was yelling and finger pointing and accusations. And they're trying to figure out how do we get to some sort of conclusion. And then after this long decision, Peter, who's not shy of words, stands up and he gives us two cents. Verse seven. At the meeting, after a long decision, Peter stood and addressed them as followers. Brothers, you all know that God chose me from among you some time ago to preach to the Gentiles so that they could hear the good news and believe. God knows people's hearts, and he confirmed that he accepts Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. He made no distinction between them and us, for he cleansed their hearts through faith. So why are you now challenging God by burdening the Gentile believers with a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors were able to bear? We believe that we're all saved the same way by the undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus. I want to make a few things clear about what Peter says here. Peter, like Paul and Barnabas, has seen what God's been up to in the non-Jewish communities around the world. He has seen how the Gentiles have responded to the gospel message, the good news of Jesus. And in verse 8, he agrees with Paul and Barney, and he says, God knows people's hearts. And he confirmed that he accepts Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit. I've seen this with my own two eyes, Peter says. Secondly, Peter recognizes that not only did they receive the message, but he has seen how it's changed their lives. He says he cleansed their hearts. Through These are new people. (laughs) They're no longer the same, Peter says. And then thirdly, Peter asks a question of those who are advocating that circumcision and following the law is required for someone to be saved. And he says to them, why should we ask them to do something we've never been able to do ourselves? Haven't you read the Old Testament, Peter says? Our Jewish ancestors have never been great at keeping the law. And now you're asking these Gentile believers to do the same? Why would we require something of them that we can't do ourselves, especially in light of what Jesus has done for us? How silly of us to ask them to do that. And finally, Peter finishes with a flourish saying, we're all saved by the undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus. And then he drops the mic and he walks back to his chair. But then something miraculous happens. Listen to this. Verse 12. Everyone listened quietly as Barnabas and Paul told them about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. This is a miracle. Just moments before, there was debate raging, arguments and finger pointing and yelling and who knows what else was going on. Fist fights in the corner. I have no idea. And then it says, everyone listened quietly. There's this hush as this realization is made among all of them. Paul and Barnabas, Peter and the apostles, the Judean men, the Christian Pharisees, they all end up at the same place. They fought tooth and nail for it, but they all end up at this one place where they realize God's grace is non-negotiable. It's not negotiable. You can't add to it. You can't argue it. You can't add to it. Verse 13, when they'd finished, James stood and said, Brothers, listen to me. Peter's told you about the time God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for himself. And this conversion of Gentiles is exactly what the prophets predicted. Then he quotes the book of Amos and he says, Afterward, I will return and restore the fallen house of David. I will rebuild its ruins and restore it so that the rest of humanity 
might seek the Lord, including the Gentiles, all those I have called to be mine. The Lord has spoken. He who made these things known so long ago. And then James says, and so my judgment is that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Thank God. We'd be sacrificing goats right now if it wasn't for this debate. James, you know, was the half-brother of Jesus. He would go on to write the book of James, but he was also considered the lead or the senior pastor of the church in Jerusalem. And he had a leading voice in this. He was obviously the leader among leaders in this discussion. And he not only agrees with Peter and Paul and Barnabas, but then he makes this official stance of all believers that it is only by God's grace through Jesus that a person is saved. Nothing more and nothing less. And then James ends this section by saying this, verse 20. Instead, we should write and tell them to abstain from eating food offered to idols, from sexual immorality, from eating the meat of strangled animals, and from consuming blood. For these laws of Moses have been preached in Jewish synagogues in every city on every Sabbath for many generations. Now, I know what you're thinking. Wait, hold on a second. Didn't he just say God's grace? And then now he's saying you got to do all this stuff I know that's a great question. I'm not going to answer it. You have to come back next week and hear about it, okay? You got to come back next week. Because James is going to send this letter. We're going to get into it. It's really important. It's really important, especially when you understand what grace really is. But for now, I just want us to focus on the debate of what is required to follow Jesus and to belong to the church, the mission of God. Because we may not argue over the issue of circumcision as a requirement to be saved, but history has taught us that we will try to add just about anything to the requirements of what it means to follow Jesus, won't we? In fact, it might be a political requirement, it might be a financial requirement. It might be a behavioral requirement or a philosophical requirement. You name it. Christians have decided we, it can't just be about grace. It's too good to be true. We've got to add something to it. You have to at least be Republican. <laughs> or you at least have to be a Democrat. Right? Right? You, you, you got you to gotta behave in a certain way, right? You at least, you got you to gotta put pants on in the morning and come to, you got to comb your hair at least, something, because grace, it's got to be too good to be true. It can't possibly be just grace. In fact, there's this belief that I think often gets, kind of creeps into the church a lot. And the belief is, yeah, 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 Jesus, he like died on the cross. But really, uh, you know, I'm kind of, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to make my way to God and Jesus is just kind of help me along the way, right? I, I got to save myself, but then yeah, I'll add a little, sprinkle a little Jesus in there and maybe he'll help me get there, which is completely contrary to what they're arguing here. I mean, this is a line of belief that it's exactly the same as you need to be circumcised and under the law and have faith in Jesus, right? You need to be good and you need to be moral and you need to be fill in the blank and have faith in Jesus. This is what we do because grace, it, sometimes it just seems too good to be true. It can't just be grace. I have to do something. We have to earn it some way. But the good news of Jesus is only good news when nothing but his grace is attached to it. It is only by the undeserved grace of Jesus who went to the cross on our behalf, who rose again three days later to give us the hope of new life that will save us. And nothing need be or should be added to that. So this morning, I want us to take a moment to be reminded first that God's grace is non-negotiable. Stop arguing against it. It's, not a, it's a worthless argument. If you come to me and you say to me, yeah, but, I'm going to stop you there. There is no but. It is God's grace to you. 
that saves you. Paul says later in the book of Romans that while we were still sinners, while we were still rebelling against God and running away from God, doing all these things, Jesus came to us and died for us. While we were in the middle of all that, that is grace. We don't deserve it. And yet God in his love and his mercy sends Jesus. And he says, be part of my family now. You know, Jesus left no room for us to ask, yeah, but what about circumcision? This behavior, that behavior, this belief or that one. Don't you need to be part of this political party or that social status? Or you have to believe in this part. No, he says, this is grace. And it is for you. I just want to say this because if you've never heard that before, if, if you've never heard this message, that God's grace is non-negotiable and that it is for you, that you don't have to do anything to earn that, you don't have to work your way to get it, that somehow you've got to clean up your act before you can receive it, I want you to hear this morning that God's grace is for you right where you are today. And you don't have to add to it. You don't have to subtract from it. You don't have to do anything except for simply receive it. Amen. To allow his Holy Spirit to take residence in your life and to begin to change your life like he did with the Gentiles in the places that Paul and Barnabas traveled to see their lives changed that the same way that same Holy Spirit will reside in you and experience the grace that he has to offer you. I say this all the time, and I'm going to say it again. It does not matter who you are or what you've done or where you've been. God's grace through Jesus is for you. And thank God, Paul and Barnabas and his comrades traveled the 300 miles to Jerusalem to duke it out and figure out, no, stop adding to it. Stop subtracting from it. It is sufficient in and of itself. So this morning, I'm going to invite us to remember the non-negotiable grace of God, that it is at the very foundation of our faith, and that if it tells you different, I'm telling you right now, run. Run to Genesis. <laughs> run to me. I will tell you again, it's non-negotiable. Run. Run run to the Father. And so this morning, I want to invite you to celebrate the grace of Jesus through what we call communion. And communion was this meal that Jesus shared with his early disciples, his early followers, the night before he would be accused falsely and led to the cross. He met with them. He had a Passover meal. And during the meal, he took a loaf of bread. He broke it. He gave thanks. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take this and eat this and remember me. Remember my grace for you. And then he took a cup of wine and he blessed it and he gave thanks for it. And he said, this is my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. And through the shedding of my blood, a new covenant, the old is gone. The new has come. No more circumcision. No more law, just grace to you. Take this and drink this and remember me. Remember the non-negotiable grace that I offer to you. And so this morning, I want to invite you to the table. There are three stations, two on either side of me. And there's one in the back that does have a gluten-free option uh, for the bread if you need that. Um, I invite you to come to taste the bread, to taste the juice, to take one, head back to your... Joel and, and, and Justin are going to sing, and we're just going to take a moment. I want you to just take a moment to reflect on the amazing, unwavering, non-negotiable grace of God. Come to the table.